Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Praise the Lord, everybody. Can we all stand in the house of God this wonderful Sunday morning? I was glad when they said unto me, amen, let us go into the house of the Lord. I'm excited about what God has in store for this service. Amen. I wonder what would happen if we would just lift our expectation level. Amen. I know it's 930 in the morning. Amen. Some of us are just making our way in, but I want to tell you, God uh, has had it in his mind for something he wants to do in this service, and it's up to us if we're going to calibrate and get our minds uh, tapped into what God's going to do, because I've learned that my expectation level can dictate how great a move of God can take place, amen? So I wonder if you just lift your hands this morning. Everybody across the building, lift your hands. Uh, Lord, we love you. Lord, we reach for you this morning. God, we need you. We need a touch of God this morning. Without a touch of God, we're not going to make it, Lord. Without a touch of God, Lord, we're not going to make it till tomorrow. We need it this morning, Lord. There are people, God, that are just barely making it. There are people, God, that are coming in needing a miracle. I'm asking you that you do that miracle. I'm asking you that you would come through. I'm asking you that you would encourage those that are downtrodden. Lord, I pray that the joy of the Lord would be our strength this morning. Lord, I pray you would move in the music this morning. I pray that the liberty of the Holy Ghost would be here. God, we need a breakthrough. We need a touch of God. Lord, there's going to be sinners walking in, and they need a touch of God. Lord, backsliders are watching. Lord, they need a touch of God. I pray you would visit with us this morning. I pray we'd have an encounter with you. I pray we would get into the holiest of holies. Oh, Lord, we need you, Jesus. Uh, we can't do it without you, Jesus. Hallelujah, we need him. Church, we need him. Church, do you want him? Church, do you want more than just a Sunday morning routine? Do you want more than just another Sunday morning? But do you want a supernatural touch of God? presence of God, I promise you, if you open your heart to receive something, God's going to have something special for you this morning. Amen? Amen. God bless the music team as they come. You can be seated if you like. Praise the Lord. I believe it. I don't want just a another Sunday, but I want another day to come and worship the Lord and praise His holy name. How many of you feel that this morning? Amen. I want a new and fresh anointing today. And if you're sitting, I'm going to invite you to stand and invite you to come down to the altar if you'd like to. We're going to sing some songs about the Lord. And if you're feeling weak in your spirit today or maybe down or maybe going through something, well, I'll tell you what, you're in the right place today because we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He takes care of us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's our joy when we have sorrow. Hallelujah. Does somebody believe that today? Amen. Hallelujah. Why don't we all clap our hands this morning? How many believe that God can turn some things around for you today? Well, God said he would turn it around. God said he would turn it around. What the devil meant for evil, God will make it good. Turn around, turn around, oh, turn around. Well, God said he would turn it around. Yes, he did. God said he would turn it around. Oh, what the devil meant for evil. Turn around, turn around, turn around. Oh, God said he would turn it around. Well, I know it may, may not be so 
control. Somebody give him all the praise. God is in control. Somebody give him all the praise. God is in control. Your sadness as you remember his name. Morning into dancing, sorrow into joy. Every day will be sweeter than the day before. Oh, God said he would turn it around. God said he would turn it around. What the devil meant for evil. Oh, no, my God, he'll take care of it. And joy for your pain Praise for your sadness As you remember his name Oh, morning into dancing And sorrow into joy Every day will be sweeter Than the day before Oh, God said he would turn it around all the praise. God is in control. Somebody give him all the praise. God is in control. Come on, let's give him all the praise. God is in control. Turn around, turn around. Oh my God said, he would turn it around. God said, he would turn it around. And what the devil meant for evil. Oh no, my God's gonna
passes a fence around his children. His grace is sufficient to stand the storm. Woo! Amen! And his word is a promise we can lean on when the winds of this world are blowing strong. I know that Jesus is the storm I know I can always count on him when I hear the knock. Oh, he holds my hand.
it today. I believe it today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we serve a great God, a powerful God. There's no one like him. There's none beside him or before him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, somebody, let's lift our hands and worship that Jesus today. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you, God. We praise you, God. We glorify you today, Lord. There is none like you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's continue to worship him this morning. There was no way 
God is a covenant-keeping God. He is a faithful God. Faith is building in this place because somebody is believing that the Lord is faithful to His Word. Hallelujah! Many people don't realize how significant it is to say that God is a covenant-keeping God. That he is faithful to his word. You know, God being faithful to his word is simply a repetition of Genesis chapter 1. Where God said, let it be and it was so. You believing that God is faithful to you is equivalent to you believing that God spoke creation into existence and creation responded because when the Lord gives out his word it does not return void but it accomplishes that which he sent it to do do you believe that God created the world do you believe it that he created everything that you see do you believe that he spoke and it was so then you must know that God is a covenant keeping God. He is faithful to His Word. You gotta know it, you gotta know it, that if God is your God, then you can reach into your covenant with Him and plead the blood over your life. You can plead His blood over your situation because you've been washed in that blood, because you've been baptized in His name, because He's placed His Spirit in you. You can reach into that covenant and call on that name that is above every other name. Oh, can we praise the Lord for just a few moments and glorify Him because He speaks and it is so because He speaks and it is done. And we're going to pray for our needs today. We're going to pray for your situation today. And I want you to remember that after God spoke and creation responded, after he, the world, the universe was faithful to respond to his declared word, in the end he said that he saw that it was good. Bashata, 
He saw that it was good. And you may not know how God is going to show up in your life. You may be going through the desert right now. You may be going through the valley. But I want to tell you, if you just hold on to your faith in God, in the end of the day, you're going to look back and you're going to say, it was good. It was good. It was good. And God is going to say, it was good. Hallelujah. It was good. You may be in it right now, but God is going to complete the picture in its time if you just keep having faith. Come on. Does somebody believe in God today? Does anybody believe in God today? If you have a need right now, just lift your hand. If you believe that God is a creator, if you believe that he's able to speak and your situation will respond, just lift up your hands. It could be a sickness. It can be an illness. You can need something right now, provision from God. Church, why don't you turn around and pray for somebody? Church, if you believe that your God is a covenant-keeping God, pray with somebody. And we're calling on the name of that God whom we are in covenant within the name of Jesus oh God you see every need God you see every need Jesus that is yet in the process of responding God to your word God I pray in the name of Jesus that healing would come God where healing is needed I rebuke God every cancerous cell God in these bodies Lord God in the name of Jesus I rebuke the chaos and the disorder God uh, that's within bodies God that need to come into order in the name of Jesus uh, we rebuke diabetes Lord God uh, we rebuke depression God and anxiety today in the name of Jesus God bring them into their right mind God bring them into their right mind uh, in the name of Jesus uh, I pray your provision provide God uh, God and let us see that you're a good God that in the end we would declare it is good and according to your word in the name of Jesus oh if you believe God is doing something powerful in our midst why don't you just praise him today come on somebody give him glory ah, in the name of Jesus how many of you believe the word of God that revival is here and coming in Stockton, California? Ah, uh, yeah. God has spoken the word, and it doesn't matter how much Satan wants to fight it, it's going to happen in Jesus' name because there's a praying church that believes it. Come on. There's a praying church that believes it. And we're going to pray for our city. We're going to pray for this nation. Hallelujah. We're going to pray for this nation in Jesus' name with faith, with faith believing. Like if it was the first time we were to pray, hallelujah, for this city, for revival, and for this nation. Anybody feel faith in the building to do it today? Let's pray right now. Let's go to battle for our city in the name of Jesus. Lord God, you have placed us in this region. You have placed us in this city for a purpose, Lord God. It's a divine purpose that your spirit would be poured out, God, upon all flesh. God, all flesh, all flesh within this city, Lord God. And you promised that it would happen in the last days, God. We're living in the last days. I pray, God, that you would allow us to claim that promise and invoke that promise upon this city. In the name of Jesus, I pray a flooding move of your power, a flooding move, God, of your spirit would overcome this city, God, that it would overcome this region, that the whole San Joaquin Valley, God, may see and know that you are God. In the name of Jesus, we pray for the north and the south to release their souls, God, release their souls. In the name of Jesus, the east and the the West uh, to release their souls uh, that all would know that you are God. Uh, we pray God for the leaders of our city uh, that you would begin to reveal your righteousness to them uh, and ignite within them God uh, an understanding of morality, an understanding God of good 
things and righteous works, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Let your people be enabled, God. Let your church be enabled, even by the laws of this land. Let the church be enabled by the leaders and the government officials, God, to be freed, God, to preach the gospel, to be free, God, to be what you have called us to be. And if not, God, we will still not bow, God, to the enemy. And if not, we will still be faithful to your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Oh, Rabbi. Ah, I feel the Holy Ghost today. Can we just praise him? For a few moments, can we lift up his holy name? Hey, we thank you, God. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. You may make your way back to your seats. Please remain standing. We only have a few announcements. We're going to move very quickly here today. Amen. Stockton, California and Christian Life Center is still in revival. Hallelujah. We're going to have Brother A.J. Holloway here with us this, this week. Amen. He's going to be with us Monday through Wednesday at 7 p.m. at our West Lane campus. Any of our visitors that are here visiting us and getting to know Christian Life Center, you're welcome to come out to every service. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we're going to have a great time in the Holy Ghost, and we're going to hear from the voice of God. Amen. We're going to hear from the voice of God. Amen. Praise God. We have our vacation Bible school that's coming out, coming up for our children. Amen. Amen. God is wanting to raise our children up in His ways and in His Word. And this is part of the process. It's going to be July 31st through August 4th. It's going to be $30 per child. Trust me, it is well worth it to send every child to Vacation Bible School. Amen. It is worth it. You can sign up at the King Kings, Kings Kids booth. We also have a flyer that's going around. You can scan the QR code. You just take your camera out and point it towards the QR code, this little square on our flyers, and you'll be able to sign up that way. We also need volunteers full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Believing in God. Amen. If anyone's ever desired to minister to a child, which is one of the most precious things that we could do, raise up a child in the way of the Lord, we need you to volunteer. Amen. And if you can please sign up at the booth at or at clministry.com slash VBS. It's now time for our Sunday morning tithe and offering. We celebrate giving an offering to God here at CLC because we see it as a blessing. It's a blessing to our lives. And it is a joy to give to the Lord because God honors the cheerful giver. Anybody believe that today? Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Let's repeat these, uh, this declaration together. Amen. The Word of God says... Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Upon the authority of the word of God, we declare that the Lord is our provider. As one who tithes and gives offerings, I am entitled to his blessings and protection from the attacks of the enemy. Therefore, I bring my tithe and offering into the storehouse today, knowing that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. For employees, we claim good jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, promotions and benefits, and favor with our employers and customers in the workplace. For business owners, we claim favorable contracts and growth, and that these businesses will be profitable and a blessing to the kingdom. For his people, the Lord shall supply income, inheritances, estates, interest, rebates, unexpected gifts and blessings, bills and debts will be paid off, allowing me to live debt free. 
Since spiritual blessings follow the deliver, I declare that my whole family is saved and in relationship with God. We receive perfect health, healing, deliverance, and walking in the divine favor and blessing of the Almighty. Say it. I am blessed coming in and going out, and all that I put my hand to do will prosper in Jesus' name. We thank you, God, for your blessings in our life today in Jesus' name. God bless you as you give. On the floor, you may march. On the balcony, they'll wait. we'll wait on you. this morning so we can't hear ourselves in the pulpit we're going to take a few minutes and work on that uh, so our preacher today will be able to hear what he's preaching and uh, but in the meantime why don't you turn around and greet someone and let them know it's good to see him in the house of God thank you
Testing, one, two, testing. Testing, testing one. Testing one, two. Yeah, we're good here. Test. It's nice and loud. Testing one, two. Testing one, two, three. It's cutting out. Testing one, two, testing one, two, three. Now it's not cutting out. Yeah, but we'll just have that as a backup. Testing one, two, three. It's cutting out right here. It's cutting out right here. This is where it's cutting out. Let's not do it. Or maybe we'll just, we'll just switch to this one. You want to take your places, and we're going to move on this morning. All right, we got the sound fixed up here, a wire got pulled off, and so it's going to be a simple, inexpensive fix for us. We like that, don't we? <laughs> Amen. But uh, I, want to, I want to talk to you just for a few moments uh, before we go to the Word of the Lord, but um, this, uh, toward the end of this month, starting on the uh, 22nd, uh, I believe that's a Saturday. We're going to have with us uh, Brother David Smith uh, that is going to uh, speak here for about four or five nights, uh, starting that Sunday. But that Saturday, we are going to have a uh, altar workers seminar uh, in the church, and he's going to teach that. Now, I think we've had him that I remember. I've only had him here one time. Maybe he's been here twice, but I think it's just been once. But 
He's a very gifted man of God uh, in this area, praying people through to the Holy Ghost and working altars. This is one of the gifts that God has given him. And he's going to help train us and teach us how to work our altars. Uh, I think one of the reasons that we don't work the altars sometimes is we're uncomfortable and we're not really sure how to go about doing it with a complete stranger or someone that we're not really uh, close to. And so on that Saturday, I want you just to mark it off on your calendars. This is not for just a select group, but I would like the entire church to be part of that because I think that the entire church should be uh, altar workers at Christian Life Center. I think that needs to happen. And I also believe that each and every one of you that are in right standing with God have that ability and call of God to do that. And so uh, training is going to be one of the vital uh, ways we encourage ourselves and we build up our confidence. And one of the reasons that a lot of people don't get the Holy Ghost when we pray for them is we don't exert confidence and faith, but we kind of come with that, uh, I wonder if God's going to do this, and we're timid. So this is going to be really good to erase that, and I, it would be wonderful if we had two or 300 altar workers at this church. Uh, sinners wouldn't have a chance. Everywhere they went, somebody would be ready to pray them through the Holy Ghost. So I want you to um, ma make a point to be here, and that's part of the growth of this church. Amen. We'll talk more about it as we get closer today. But let's stand this morning. We're getting ready to go to the Word of God. And this morning, we have with us uh, Brother Mark Morgan from San Francisco. Amen. And he's no stranger here. He preaches here many, many times. Sundays he's preached here, many landmarks he's preached here. He's a great man of God. Uh, he's a prophet, he's a pastor, he's a teacher, and um, he's anointed of God. And every time he comes to this pulpit, he gives us a word that has longevity. It's not something that just is for the moment we get excited, but it's something you can feast on and chew on and draw nutrition from as the uh, months go by even after he's gone. And so it's always our privilege and it's always a great honor for Christian Life Center to have a man of God of this caliber to step in the pulpit. I'd like you to welcome him and the Word of God that's coming today. God bless you, Brother Morgan. Thank you, sir. Bless you. Praise God. Let's clap to the Lord this morning and give him praise adoration. He is worthy of all praise. Hallelujah. I give the Lord praise this morning for them fixing these monitors. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I tell you, I used, to, I used to think that the devil got in the sound system. And I used to say that when the devil fell out of heaven, he fell into the sound booth. But I don't say that anymore. Amen. God bless you. Amen. It's good to see everybody here this morning. And uh, I'm thankful that uh, uh, you've had me scheduled a couple times before. And uh, I've had some health issues. And uh, <clears throat> matter of fact, uh, some of it was stemming from Landmark. I came to Landmark and left with the wonderful gift of COVID. Thank you very much. Amen. And uh, then uh, it triggered some heart issues. And so I've kind of, so I'm just glad to be scheduled and show up. Amen. And, uh, I have a little mischievous side. And I almost text Sister Vicki Ogden this morning, just about the time church was starting, and tell her, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. 
but it's not April the 1st, so I didn't do it. Amen. Praise God. I certainly have a lot of respect and appreciation for your pastor and his family and the great leadership that God's given you. Amen. And uh, I always enjoy being around Brother Haney and, and uh, iron sharpeneth iron, and I appreciate his insight into the Word of God and his relationship with God. Amen. And it's definitely tells that it's there. So, amen. God bless him. And of course, it's good to be in service with my wife's family here. Matter of fact, I think my wife's in here somewhere sitting with her mother. Uh, or that's what she, oh, there they are. Amen. Why? Well, and your mother's here? All right, well, while you're there, pray her through to the Holy Ghost today if you can. Amen. <laughs> Genesis chapter 22 and verse number 17. I had full anticipation of preaching something completely different today. And uh, if I get into this and I shouldn't be here, I'll just go back and preach that one. <laughs> I'll just shift it over and you'll never even know I did it. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, but... I, I service progressed and I just kept feeling this more in my spirit. So we're going to go in this direction. Genesis chapter 22 and verse number 17, that in blessing, I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand, which upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. I like that, don't you? And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Amen. Man, y'all, y'all had me just moving around a lot this morning in my emotions and stuff. And then the good brother that was leading the service got talking about our God's a covenant God, and he's he's faithful to his word, and uh, it's impossible for God to lie. Do you know that? And, uh, you know, I'm going to talk to you this morning about uh, the gates, taking the battle to the gates. That'd be all right? You can be seated. I'm going to tell you real quickly something. I think I've preached it here before, but I sat next to a lady on the plane one day, and when we started out, thank God for upgrades. You ought to thank God for upgrades for people my size because when they see you coming in the economy seat, they're like, oh, Lord, have mercy. And uh, sitting there, and this lady, at first I thought she's going to be very obnoxious and kind of rude to the flight attendant. And then as we got into the flight, she began to talk to me. She was a professor. And uh, she told me what she taught and all this, and then she made reference that she did a lot of lectures uh, on Old Testament covenants. And I got really interested in the conversation. And she said, matter of fact, I teach a lot in Christian churches. So she proceeded to tell me. She went into the name of God and all this stuff. And then she got into it and she said, you know, uh, in Old Testament covenants, what they would do is they'd cut the animal that they were offering as a sacrifice or animals, they'd cut them in half and they would walk among the pieces and they would say, uh, be it unto me as unto these pieces if I don't keep this covenant. And so she was telling me all of that and, and uh, she talked for quite a while, a long while. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but when she got done, she said, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't even really know your name, and I've been talking. And uh, she said, what do you do for a living? <laughs> I, and she, she, was, she was a Jewish descent, so I said, I'm a Christian pastor. She said, oh, <laughs> now I know why you seem so interested in what I was saying. I said, I, I, I'm very interested in it. And I said, matter of fact, we practice what you just said. And she said, you do? I said, yeah, we're very strong people. I said, number one, 
I said, we believe in one God. And she said, and you're a Christian? I said, yes, we're a Christian, but uh, we don't believe in a triune and all that stuff. So she said, well, that's interesting. And I said, yeah. And I said, and we practice that covenant. And she said, how do you practice it? I said, well, you said that it, animal had to be sacrificed and that it had to be done in the name of the greater party. She said, that's correct. I said, well, we practice that. She said, how do you practice it? I said, we practice that through water baptism. Kind of like your mikvah, we practice that in water baptism. We believe that there was a sacrifice and we do it in the name of the greater party. Now, hopefully you'll catch on what that name is. Neither is there salvation in the other, for there's none of the name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now, when I said that, she said, well, I don't accept him as my Messiah. And I said, I, I know that. I understand that. But I said, but I listened to you for almost two hours. And all I need is about 15 minutes. So I proceeded to talk to her about baptism, how it was a covenant and all, and, and uh, circumcision and all that stuff. Boy, she just... She said, I have never heard this before. I thought, man, that's pretty good. I'm teaching the professor right now. So I told her about all that. And uh, so we, we, we landed and we were taxiing up to the gate. And she said, she said, Reverend, I want to tell you a verse and I want you to study it. And I think you'll see what I'm talking about. She said, now remember what I told you about covenants. So she said, study Genesis chapter 15. And then she told me that in Jeremiah, there's a verse to substantiate about the divided pieces and walking among them and, and be it unto me as according to the, with these animals, let it be done to me as it done to them. So in Jeremiah, it tells you that the princes didn't keep their covenant. They didn't walk in their oath. Therefore, I will feed their flesh to the fowl of the air and to the beast of the field. And so, and it talks about them walking among the pieces. So. I got to Genesis chapter 15 and brother, it clicked, it clicked because Abraham has divided these pieces, but it's not Abraham that walks through the pieces. It's God. God was signifying to us and to Abraham. He was signifying, let it be done unto me as under these pieces. If I don't keep my word to you. Now, that's extremely important to us. God cannot lie. It's impossible for, it's, he cannot lie. One of the reasons why that God cannot lie is because he's eternal. I don't know if I can explain that correctly. He's eternal. Meaning there is no place nor time for him to change. Uh, eternity is, he is what he is, and it just stays that way. So whatever he was in the beginning, he's all the way through. It just, it never changes. So if God told you something, if God spoke something to you, if God entered into covenant with you, then the fact is it's impossible for him to lie to you. If he told you something, then it's not going to change. Praise God. Praise God. Our God cannot lie. The New Testament teaches that. Right? There's no shadow of turning in him. There's no variableness because there is no place nor time for him to change in any way. He's eternal. Now that ought to put you on shouting ground because if your God was not eternal, then that means he could change. He has space and time to change, but thank God that he's Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, forever. If God spoke to you, I don't care if he spoke to you a hundred years ago. He didn't lie to you. If he spoke it to you, he didn't lie to you. Praise God. He is a covenant keeping God. And uh, a part of the, this covenant, see that fit right there. And I didn't even know it was going to fit, but it did. As a part of that covenant that he makes with Abraham, and, uh, you know, I, I kind of stand here, not intimidated, I don't guess, but a little reluctant because uh, your pastor's knowledge of all this stuff and all. So hopefully I don't say something that's wrong and 
if, if, if I say something that's wrong, he can straighten it out and y'all can fire me and I'll never come back. Amen. <laughs> and I certainly mean that. Amen. But in this covenant that God made with Abraham. Now, one of the things that we learn in the scripture is, is that the natural comes before the spiritual. It's very important for us to understand that. The natural always comes before the spiritual. Paul taught that to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he said the natural came first, talking about the first Adam. But the second, the last Adam, of course, he said is the Lord from heaven. And so in order for you to understand, in order for you to understand the last Adam, you have to have an object. You have to have something over here that you can see. You have to have something in the natural. And that's the reason why that I teach very strong that the only way for you to understand the recreation is by the lens of the creation. Mm. Over in Colossians chapter one, where it talks about he was before all things, if I am all things consist, and everybody and a lot of Trinitarians jump on that and say, see, there he was, he's all the way back at creation, talking about Jesus Christ. But Paul was not talking about the original creation, he was talking about the recreation. Because he didn't say that Jesus Christ was the first man form, he said that he was the first one born from the dead. So he's talking about Jesus having preeminence meaning he is the first one in this new creature, this new creation, but there's others coming, us, amen. But to understand Jesus Christ, you have to look at the first Adam. Of course, the first Adam's put to sleep out of his side, his rib, and then he wakes up and God says, surprise, 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 amen. God's the first anesthesiologist, amen. And so he presents to Adam, this woman whose name was Eve, and of course, we see the rest of that story. I won't get into all of it. But when you watch all of that and you see the things that God gave to uh, Adam and the commandments that God gave to Adam and the, the responsibilities that God gave to Adam, that was in the natural. But the last Adam is not going to escape the same responsibilities. To tend the garden, to keep the garden, to guard the garden, and don't let wild beasts in here. When it says that he named the animals, it didn't mean that he just kind of smoked something and got a little high and looked over and said, it's a hippopotamus. <laughs> I mean, some of those names, that's what you'd think, amen. When it says that he named the animals, he was declaring his jurisdiction over them. He was declaring that I have dominion over you. They were not domesticated, I don't think they were, but he's declaring that I have authority and that I'm going to set these boundaries. I believe that's what that means. But then you see where he makes a mistake and he lets a serpent in the garden. So he's not fulfilling his responsibility. And so now the rest is history. So the last Adam, which is Jesus Christ, out of his side comes something called the church. If Jesus is the last Adam, then the church is the last Eve. Just as it was a responsibility of the first Adam to protect Eve, it is the responsibility of the last Adam to protect the church. Mm. I don't want to get, it's his responsibility to protect the church. If you watch Jesus Christ, he's in the temptation. And while he's in the temptation, uh, the Bible says that wild beasts came to him. That doesn't mean that a jackal or a hyena or whatever, or a bear or a lion came to him. That is dealing with demonic things. Because the very next statement is, and the angels came and ministered to him. Ooh. So now we got this spiritual activity going on, but God says, look, I'm going to send, I, I, angels are coming to minister. Amen. And so you watch that, then you watch in the book of Revelation, the 12th chapter, got this wonder in heaven. Now this is your expertise over here, but you got this wonder in heaven and all this stuff and a dragon and he's ready to devour and all. But God says, I'm going to protect her. I'm not like the first Adam. I am the last Adam and it's my responsibility to protect her. And so I've got a place prepared for her in the wilderness. And you go ahead and open your mouth, dragon, and send a flood after her. I'll just open up creation and I'll swallow everything that you're sending against her. I'm telling you, we are the church of the living God and we are the apple of his eye. If you're a part of the church, you ought to be happy right now. He is bound 
to keep you and to protect you. And he's not only bound to keep and protect you, but he's also bound to provide for you. Man that does not provide for his own household is worse than an infidel and denied the faith. And somebody tried to convince me that they was a preacher and had a ministry. And I said, I, I, don't, I don't see that. I don't think that's true. And they said, why is that? I said, because you don't provide for your family. Well, that went over real well. <laughs> it's his duty. Now, that was sermon number two. Now I'm back to the main one here. So he gives him, he gives him these promises. He makes this covenant with him. And of course, I think that what he gave to, to Abraham as the sand of the seashore, the natural, I believe that it applies to us spiritually. Now, I know that some of it kind of overlaps each other. I, I believe that. But notice that he said that your seed, not your seeds, but your seed. Now, when you get into the New Testament, Paul teaches you very strongly who that seed is. He said it was not plural, it's singular. And then he teaches us that that seed, that seed is Jesus Christ. And through that seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, when you get over uh, in studying, I think, in Galatians and starts talking about the seed and all then the promise, uh, that that's what Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, that it was God's intent to allow his promise through the seed of Abraham to be applied to everybody, whosoever will. That's why Peter says, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to those that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Because God said, all the families of the earth shall be blessed through thy seed. And the promise of the seed of Abraham is the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Now, in this covenant that he's making with Abraham here, he, uh, he establishes this. The last part of it is, and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemy. Now, remember that Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham. Mm. So, remember when Jesus is standing at Caesarea Philippi. And he says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Some say you're Jeremiah, John the Baptist, the last one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? Uh, thou, art, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood, not reveal this to you, but, but my father which is in heaven. This is a spiritual revelation. But I want you to know that upon this rock, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Now again, he, he does the tours and he, I mean, he's not, I, I don't mean that just, but I know he understands has great insight on this. But when Jesus is standing there at Caesarea Philippi, of course, the gates of hell, according to a lot of people was, that it was a place, literal place there, that was viewed as that the underworld was released through that gate there in Caesarea Philippi and pan all these gods and all the stuff and all. So it's amazing to me that Jesus Christ goes to the very gate of hell and declares, I'm the seed of Abraham and I am going to possess this gate I'm going to build my church right here. And that gate's not going to prevail against it because a part of the covenant is I would possess the gates of my enemy. I want to tell you something right now. God can build a church in any place at any time. I never forget, I was pastoring there in Oklahoma and brother, we were it just... People, I know people don't believe half the stories I tell, but they're, they're true. And I mean, buddy, we were, having, we were having some major spiritual conflicts and it just going crazy. And so I went into the office to study and get ready for Sunday. It's on Saturday night and I got in there 
And I got to reading over there where Simon Peter's given salutations. And he makes this statement, in the church which is at Babylon, saluteth you and so doth Marcus my son. And when I read that, the Holy Ghost said, Peter took a little missionary journey, went right into Babylon and built a church. Babylon represents everything evil all the way into the book of Revelation. And the Lord kind of impressed me with that. If Peter can go right into the very heart of this thing and he can build a church and send back salutations, which means all is well, then you know what? You can build a church in any city. You can build a church in any community. You can build a church in any environment. You can build a church in any culture. I feel the help of the Holy Ghost right now. Don't let the devil ever lie to you and tell you it's too bad, it's too far gone, it's too evil, it's too corrupt. I'm telling you, greater is he that's within us than he that is in the world. And he said, and I'm going to repeat it, upon this rock, the rock of revelation, if anybody ought to be possessing the gates of their enemy, it ought to be one God covenant people who knows who he is and entered into covenant relationship with him through water baptism. Praise God. Now, this, this is really pressing me in the spirit the last few weeks. Matter of fact, I preached along these lines at our camp meeting. And uh, the word kept coming to me. Just, you know how things just start coming into your spirit. It just started. And it was the word portal, portal. So I, uh, I went to the scripture and started just trying to define it a little bit better. And so basically a portal's a gate. A portal is where something is released or something enters, but mostly something is released through it. It becomes a portal, a conduit, a place that something is released. Now, I'm gonna tell you that it is extremely important for the church to start identifying these portals because I believe these are places that the enemy releases certain things into the world and I'm going to tell you and I'll just jump right in the middle of it right here California is a major portal to the world I read an article one time and says as SF Berkeley goes so goes the nation we have been a portal to everything you can imagine that flows into this nation We've given them all kinds of gifts. Hollywood. Boy, it got quiet there. <laughs> I would say a few other things, but uh, I probably better not, amen. <laughs> I was getting ready to name some of our government officials that we gave them. We gave them the hippie movement. California has major portals in it. And a lot of times we kind of sit back looking at it saying, well, there's really nothing we can do. It's just the way it is. We just can't stop it. It's just the end time. Perilous times are going to come. I believe in all of that. But I also read to you something that said that the seed of Abraham is going to possess the gates of his enemies. But if we stand back, oh, let me talk about it here a second. See, there's, there's a principle that's involved. Simon Peter, Paul makes this statement. He's writing to the Corinthians. He says, I will tarry here at Ephesus until Pentecost because there is an effectual open door unto me, but there are many adversaries. Now that's always intrigued me. It's always intrigued me. Matter of fact, when we went to the Philippines and back in 2000, 2001, when I was having crusades and uh, God spoke to me about that verse and uh, I preached about it. Of course, Brother Mallory talks about the, the, the weird stuff that happens after that, but it was in a prophecy. We were in a service there in Manila at the headquarters church and the spirit of God moved in there so strong. It literally sounded like a freight train moved in that building. It was a roar. When I opened my eyes, I mean, everybody in the building was pretty well flat on their face. I mean, it just like somebody put a bomb in there and it went off. And brother Mallory was standing there and then a prophecy went forth talking about an open door. And that there are many adversaries, but what God was going to do in that nation, what God was going to do in that part of the world. And so, but I've, I've studied this out and, 
it talks about, uh, for, uh, have you ever read that over there where it talks about the angel's desire to look into these things? Remember that verse and on? We say, well, it's salvation. It didn't say thing, it said things. Which if you study it, it's about the prophecies of Jesus Christ. So I believe that what the spirit world becomes a student of is it becomes a student of prophecy. It studies prophecies. Of course, prophecies is our predictions. Prophecies is where God speaks to us. Prophecies, it's apparent that there was a prophecy that Paul understood about this open door. He, he had to have spiritual understanding about this open door. But then he says, but there are many adversaries. I believe that when something is spoken by the spirit, that while we're sitting there trying to figure out if we believe it or not, well, I don't know if he's a prophet or a false prophet. I, I don't know. That's just, you know, and all, I mean, we're here arguing about all this stuff and all. What we don't understand is the whole spirit world's already in movement toward it. It knows the power of prophecy. Woo. I said, it knows the power of prophecy. Now, when you're there and it's being prophesied, you get all excited, inspiration, and I mean all the stuff and all. But when you wake up the next morning, that's usually gone. And that thrill and that rush is not there. And then if you're not careful, you just kind of back away from it. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Paul spoke to Timothy. He said, now, Timothy, concerning the prophecies that went before on you, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Timothy, you need to remember the prophecies. And you need to go to war for the prophecies. That prophecy is a door that I showed you. It's a window that I showed you. And your enemy is doing everything it can to bunker there and to hinder you and to keep you. There are many adversaries. But Timothy, I didn't lie to you. I told you these things. Now you need to go to war for it. I'm going to tell you one of the worst things that can happen is God can speak something to you and it doesn't happen overnight. So you just decide, I'm just going to back off. It must not be God. And I just give up. And you know, it must, somebody lied to me and some false prophet and you're getting all that stuff and all. And you just, I'm going to tell you something. If God spoke to you, you need to be stirred up here today and you need to go to war for that prophecy. That gate belongs to me. And I know that there's an enemy that's there. And I know he's doing everything to distract me and to keep me from going through that door. But I'm going through. I can tell the way some of you are acting. You done give up on it. Well, it just didn't come to pass. Yeah, I'm getting too old for it to happen. Woo. God did not lie to you. He can do it so fast, as we said, to make your head swim. It can happen so fast. God doesn't need a lot of time to get it done. He can suddenly do what he told you that he was going to do. And when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son. I'm telling you, when the fullness of time comes, you want to make sure that you're standing at the right place, doing the right thing, believing the right thing. We got to take, I mean, now listen, Paul's seen it. He's seen it. He's seen it. And within a two-year period of time, you know, I mean, there are many adversaries. Well, we'll talk about the adversaries. Paul said, I, at Ephesus, I wrestle with the beast of Ephesus. Now, some people think that's demonic. I lean that away pretty strong. Other people didn't feel like he was in the Colosseums wrestling. Then he's got a city that's filled with curious arts, which means it's a very spiritual city given over to curious arts, witchcraft, and all this stuff. And then, I mean, he's got, he's got adversaries there, some in the spirit, some in the flesh. But he's seen the fact that Ephesus was a portal. But because it was a portal, the enemy did everything it could to stop it. An open and effectual door, but there are many adversaries. CLC, you are a portal. You're a portal. It, I'm gonna say it again, you're a portal. 
but there are many adversaries. You got natural, you got spiritual, you got humans, you got demonic, you got all kinds of stuff that wants to be your adversary. Now you can either focus on one or two things. You can either look at your adversary and say, oh my God, man, I don't think we can ever beat that. Or you can look at that open door and the word effectual means it's energized or it has power. You can get your focus on the door and the power of God that's at the door or you can get distracted by the devil and everything else that's trying to keep you from going through it. Praise God. Somebody today needs to decide I'm taking the battle to the gate. I'm not going to let you take it from me. Woo. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Woo. Mm. Mm. I'm not, I'm not here to insult your city or community, but there are some very strong portals in Stockton, California. <laughs> I mean, there's just a lot of stuff comes through these gates, these portals, and uh, boy, mm. The Bible says that uh, that uh, Jacob's running to fear his life and he came to a certain place. And that certain place was Luz. That certain place was where his grandpa built his first altar in the land of Canaan. So later it becomes Bethel. But Jacob's not there for the right reasons. He's running. If you watch the route he's going, Abraham was coming this way and Jacob's running this way. And he comes to the, that place there. He took stones of that place, which historians will tell you, is he literally used stones off of his grandpa's altar for his pillow. That's a message within itself. Don't let the stones off the altars of others become a place of convenience for you. It cost them something. And so the Bible says he sleep and he has this dream. And in this dream, a ladder's let down from heaven. And uh, the Lord's at the top of the ladder. And then Jacob sees these angels ascending and descending. And he wakes up the next day and he says, surely whew, the presence of the Lord was in this place and I knew it not. Now he's not telling you that he was ignorant to the dream or the, that he just had. What he's telling you is, is that this place right here is very sacred to God. And he dwells here for this is none other but the house of God and the gate of heaven. Mm. This place of the altar, this place of sacrifice has created a portal here that we don't have a hindered heaven. We have an open heaven here and angels are ascending and descending from the throne of God into the earthly realm because this is a portal and the reason why it's a portal is because it's the place of the altar. When you study the New Testament and you start reading about the throne of God, even the old, there's many places in there that let you know that in close proximity to the throne of God is the altar. Because the only way that you can get to the throne is by the altar. Because the altar is not a place of prayer. The altar is a place of death. It's where you get rid of your will and you accept his will because his will is determined at the throne. And if you don't go by the altar and get rid of your will, your thinking, your ways, and yourself, 
you're never going to get there. Praise God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Don't anybody ever tell you being a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, is unreasonable. And then he said, be not conformed to this world, but rather be you transformed by the renewing of your minds that you might prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You can't find the will of God until you've died out. You can't find the will of God until you've been to the altar. And Oh, you can be conformed by your own way of thinking but you can also be transformed with something better which is the mind of God and the mind of Christ. You've all got to come to the place that you pray the same prayer that Jesus did. Father, not my will. Not my will. One of the biggest hindrances to apostolic revival is self-will. Not my will, but thy will be done. Woo. Mm. You show me a church that builds an altar. I'll show you a portal. I'll say it again. You show me a church that, listen, if you go on the other side of things, I'll talk about it here in just a little bit. If you go on the other side of things, if you go to some of these geographical spiritual strongholds, normally in close proximity is an altar, a shrine. He's been over in India and all these other places and stuff and all spiritual strongholds that are there. And I mean the worship and these altars that are built, the sacrifices that are made. Because the altar becomes the thing that removes the barrier and allows something to flow. It's amazing to me that Jesus is looking at Nathaniel and he says, Nathaniel, I've seen you under the fig tree. Nathaniel said, oh, wow, that's quite a word of knowledge. And Jesus said, you think that's something from this day forward? You'll see the heavens open and angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He just told Nathaniel, his brother, and all those that were there, you are now presently looking at the house of God and the gate of heaven. And oh, hey, by the way, Jacob's ladder, the Lord was at the top of it. Now he's at the bottom of the ladder. He's came to earth, who for the last Adam is the earth. The last Adam is the Lord from heaven. You couldn't traverse it. I come down to you. But anywhere that you show me an altar, which Jesus Christ was a living altar, I can only do what my father tells me. He lived completely submitted to the will of God. That's why angels would ascend and descending upon him. Now you show me a church that decides that it's going to be a portal and a gateway. I'll show you a church, number one, that has an altar built. The second thing I will show you is, is there is strong angelic activity. Oh, God, please don't go there. Why, why would we not go there? I don't know why. You know, I, I, you've probably heard me say this before, but this is what intrigues me. If I got up here and said, how many of you have ever had a devil come in your bedroom or show up in your car? And I'm not talking about your spouse. How many of you ever witnessed a demonic activity? You've seen this dark form and shape. I mean, let's just try it. How many of you ever had that happen? Now, I want you to look around. I'm going to say, I could put your hand back up. Now, if you haven't seen it, you're probably backslid. <laughs> now, why is it that we're more prone to see something evil? than we are to see something good. It's amazing to me when the prophet went and told who was it, Hezekiah, you're going to die. Hezekiah turned his face and began to pray, oh God, I'm going to die, please spare me. God said, okay, I'm going to extend your life. And he sends word to the prophet, said, go back in there and tell him 15 more years. And when the prophet went back in there and told him, God said, he's going to give you 15 more years. The, Hezekiah said, I need a sign. 
He didn't need a sign when the prophet said, you're going to die. But he needed a sign when the prophet said, you're going to live. We're more prone to believe the evil, the negative, the, than we are to believe the good side of things. And, and, and most of you said, I've seen demonic activity. Well, it shouldn't be strange to you that you begin to see angelic activity. And I can promise you the more we get into the end time, the more we're going to see angelic visitation. I want to tell a story. I want to, I want to tell a story. Uh, man, uh, Sister Haney, you, you, you were raised there and Oak Mogi was a crazy place. I mean, it was just crazy. There was so much just crazy stuff that happened there. I mean, just demonic stuff. I mean, we fought stuff and, and all. And I don't, I don't want to give too much credit to the enemy here. But I mean, we fought stuff and it was just the people, the people were bound. In the community, they were bound. They were, a lot of them were bound by addictions. They were bound by false doctrines. They were bound by their traditions, culture. I mean, we, we Oatmogi was 30 something percent Caucasian white, 30 something percent Native American, 30 something percent African American. And uh, now I'm gonna tell you, Oatmogi is the Creek Nation capital. It's the Creek Nation capital. Uh, five civilized tribes were sent over into what was called Indian Territory. Andrew Jackson seen that cotton was going to be the, where the industry was going. And so all these civilized tribes were successful businessmen. <laughs> Did you know that? I mean, some of them, like the Creek Nation, lived on the Alabama-Georgia line. They owned banks. They owned farms. And so Andrew Jackson said, we're going to move you from North Carolina, the Cherokees, the Seminoles and all that. We're going to move you out here to what's called Indian Territory. It's a lot better farmland, which was a lie. And so Oatmogi become the Creek Nation. Uh, you would call it a tribe. And the guy that was the, the councilman, the head of the council, you would call him a chief. But his, I, I prayed, well, actually Billy Hale prayed Sonny Johnson through, which was nephew to this tribal council guy. And uh, he backslid. And when I got there, I didn't even know who Sonny Johnson was. The Lord spoke to me and said, you go tell Sonny Johnson. I said, it's time. So I started asking people. I said, anybody know of a Sonny Johnson? They said, oh, yeah, yeah. Sonny Johnson used to come to church here. I said, where is he at? What I didn't know was Sonny had become the biggest drug dealer in Oak County. So they told me where he lived. And so I had this Grand Marquis car. And uh, I pulled up and. There's four or five of those guys out there. I thought maybe one of them would be Sonny, but I pulled up, rolled the window down, and I said, is Sonny Johnson here? And then it dawned on me, oh my God, they think you're police. <laughs> and one of them said, who wants to know? And I said, I'm Pastor Morgan from the Pentecostal Church. I need you to do me a favor. You tell Sonny Johnson that the Lord said it's time for him to come back. Well, Sonny was the one asking the questions. Wednesday night, him and his girlfriend showed up. He prayed through, renewed himself. She got baptized that night in Jesus' name. She received the Holy Ghost. Man, I feel, I feel a little victory here right now. And uh, Sonny's, I think it was Sonny's aunt, uh, worked in our nursery. We hired her to work in the nursery. Her name was Phyllis. And uh, she was Keeper Johnson, who was the head of the tribal council. Uh, it was his sister. And uh, she got cirrhosis of the liver. She's in the hospital and she's dying. And so we was in revival service and Sonny walked up. He said, hey, Brother Morgan, uh, Phyllis, it's not good. Matter of fact, they're going to they're gonna take her off the machines tomorrow. And they've called all the family in. And so basically she's clinically dead, but they're just going to turn the machines off in the morning. And I'm standing there and the Holy Ghost said, you tell him that she's not going to die, she's going to live. And you tell them that if they give credit to their medicine, I will take her eventually. But this has nothing to do with their medicine. It has everything to do with my name. 
So I told Sonny, I said, Sonny, Phyllis is going to be okay. He said, oh, Brother Morgan, I mean, she, you know, I said, go on up there to the hospital, get everybody up there. And I said, I got a message for him. Now I'm going to tell you, when I walked into that waiting room, I was not the most popular person in the world. Number one, I was white. I'm just telling you, I was a white man. And they didn't want their people worshiping the God of the white man. So I walked in, I told him, I said, now Phyllis is going to, Phyllis is going to live. And I said, but it don't have anything to do with your medicine. It has everything to do with the name of God. And it has everything to do with Jesus Christ. And I said, and you need to give glory to that because if you start giving glory to your medicine, she will die with this. And so they just, you know, kind of, you know, had a little stare off there. And so my assistant pastor, who I, at the time, which I just preached for Thursday and Friday night, uh, he, uh, he was with me. And so we walked in and I just went in there and took a bottle of oil and smeared a little oil on her forehead. And I just said these words and just like this. Matter of fact, this is just about this much emotion that was in the room. I said, Phyllis, God said you'll live and not die. I speak life into your body now in the name of Jesus Christ. I turned around and said, okay. So we walked out in the hallway. Brother Harmon, who was with me at the time, I told you, he said, I turned around and looked at him. He's kind of like, and I said, what's wrong? He said, that's it? I said, what, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, it don't make sense to me. You know, you said that she's going to live. I said, you know, God said she's going to live. I didn't say she's going to live. He said, that's it? I said, well, what did you expect? Did you expect me to try to help God out by grabbing her head and shaking her around? And, you know, <laughs> you ever seen certain people in the church that are coming at you, man? They're the claw of the church. And I think some people get the Holy Ghost in self-defense. And there's some people when they pray for you, you are going to have to go the next day to a chiropractor and have your neck adjusted. Because we think we got to help God out. Ooh, that really went over real well. I, I can tell right now, you've got several here that's got the claw. I said, it's done. I have to base my emotions on what God said. It's done. Next morning, seven something, Sonny called me. Why is it we always say this? Brother Morgan, you're not going to believe what just happened. <laughs> Try me. He said, Phyllis, come to a while ago. They're running tests right now. We don't know what's going on. He said, I'll call you back later. He called me back later. He said, Brother Morgan, they can't find anything wrong with her liver. Everything is fine. They're planning on dismissing her this afternoon. And that night, that night, see, I don't know if you understand what I'm about to say, but we took the battle to the gate. And that night in revival service, we had two pews of Native Americans, which we baptized in Jesus' name, and we're filled with the Holy Ghost. You've got to learn how to take the battle right to the gate of hell and stand there and say, no, 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 no. Mm. Angel, let me, let, me, let me finish my first story. Just, I'm, I'm about done. I'm really getting hungry, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm not like your pastor. He can fast and do without. You fast and pray, I'm going to feast and play, all right? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for that when I... <laughs> I'll be on my way home or say, okay, you want to make a lot of fasting, you go right ahead. If I'm, you know, please, God. I mean, we had, people were just bound. I, I want to be careful what I'm about to say, but the Bible says about the parable of the sower, they had no root. And one of the definitions of that is they had no disciplines. And people that have no disciplines are more prone to being bound by things. And dealing with them becomes a challenge because they have no disciplines to say no. And so that was kind of it. And so uh, we were in revival with uh, Sam Emery. <laughs> Boy, Sam Emery was a culture shock to Oklahoma. 
When I took the, is this okay if I talk about this a little bit? When I took the Oak Mogey Church, it was lily white. Now, if you want a boring church, just let it be all white people. I, I can talk about us. I am one. I mean, it was just, it was dull. We had no spice. I mean, there was no salt, no pepper. It was just bland. And so, oh, so I, I, Sam, come, well, I was preaching for, remember Wild Bill Yandris, remember Miss Sam? And I was preaching for revival for them. And I turned around and I said, Brother Yandris, would you let him? And I pointed toward Brother Emory. I just felt it. I said, would you let him come preach for me a couple of nights? And Brother Andrews, yeah, yeah. So after church, old Brother Emory said, I ain't come preaching for you. There ain't no way I'm going to preach for you. I said, why not? He said, because you kind of make me nervous. <laughs> well, if you don't have any sin in your life, you shouldn't have anything to be nervous about. <laughs> so he, he came. And so uh, toward the end of the revival, I, we got in the office and I said, uh, I said, now, Brother Emory, I said, uh, you're going to go back and you're going to quit your job and you're going to go on the evangelistic field. He said, you've lost your ever-loving mind. Well, I did that a long time ago. I said, and not only are you going to evangelize, but down the road somewhere, you're going to take the church in Merced. He said, now I know you've lost your mind. There ain't no way that's going to happen. I said, I'm telling you right now, the Lord said, you're going to evangelize for a season. And when that season is over, you're going to take your home church. When it was coming toward him to take the church, he called me and said, what do you think? I said, what do you mean, what do I think? That was already established a long time ago. He said, you think I'll get it? I said, I don't have any doubt. I don't know why I'm telling all that, but I am. And so now he's back holding this other revival for us. I mean, the first time he was there, buddy, he stirred it up. I mean, he was using all kinds of California vernacular. <laughs> Colorful. Talking about teenagers and what they're doing in the back seats of cars. And, and I mean, and I'm just kind of like, oh, my God. <laughs> Matter of fact, right after he left, I talked... I taught a Bible study, and at the end of it, I said, we got any questions? Let me give you a little idea of what we're talking about. I said, anybody got any questions on the lesson? And one of the elderly gentlemen raised his hand and said, I got a question. I said, okay, what's the question? He said, my question to you is, is when are you going to start defending that pulpit? I said, what? He said, you heard me. When are you going to start defending that pulpit? I said, what in the world are you talking about? He said, I'm talking about that colored fellow that's been up there preaching. I said, oh, God, now we found the real spirit here in the church. And we just started praying African-Americans through. And so I'm kind of looking at them. They're kind of like, okay, what you going to do, you know? So I told him, I said, this is not the time or place for this. He said, yeah, it is. I want to know. I said, this is not the time or place for it. Now, I'm going to tell you, sometimes I do things in the anointing, and sometimes I do things when I'm mad. Sometimes I can't tell which one's which. <laughs> and I said, this is not the time or place. He said, it is the time. I said, okay. I said, first of all, your prejudice is bleeding through. He said, I'm not prejudiced. I said, what do you mean you're not prejudiced? You're a 60-something-year-old white male that was raised in Morris, Oklahoma, where there is not one black person. Don't tell me you're not prejudiced. And I said, now, if you don't stop, I want you to go right out that back door and don't ever come back in it. He said, well, I think I will. And he stormed out. I was like, I'm glad you're gone. Bunch of nonsense. People want to control God and control the church and all. Well, I'm, I'm just all over the map here this morning. I mean, just, just, that's just stupidity. He eventually come back. He didn't get any better, but he come back. <laughs> I can't believe I'm telling He come up to me all the time. He say, I, I was, I prayed through in a verbal being revival and you just can't preach it too hard for me. I mean, he said, I cut my teeth on hard preaching, you know, like 
Well, first of all, why did you need heart preaching? That will sink in here in a second. And uh, he, I mean, he come. Well, what he did know is, is his daughter had told me that her husband had kind of roughed her up a little bit. And so this old man went down there with the ball bat, and he beat the windshield out of his son-in-law's truck and knocked the headlights out. Tried to get him to come outside. I'm gonna kill you with this ball bat. So he come up one night after church, said, "Brother Morgan, I cut my teeth on hard preaching." You can't preach it too hard for me. I said, I think I can. He said, it's like I insulted him. Oh, you can't? You can't preach it too hard for me. I said, yeah, I think I can preach it too hard for you. He said, no, you can't preach it too hard for me. I said, yeah, I think I can start preaching about temper and anger and people taking ball bats. He said, you heard. I said, I did. I said, I don't ever come back up here telling me I can't preach too hard for you. I said, because I can't preach too hard for you because you cannot control that temper of yours. Okay, I need to stop right here, I think. So we, uh, we fought it. So Brother Emery's there preaching. And so, man, we had folding chairs out. We had folding chairs across the front. We had them going down the center aisle. And the Brother Emery's preaching. I mean, man, he was getting into it. And, and he, he come down to the center aisle, and he got about maybe a quarter way down the center aisle. And when he did, I seen this, this light appear, and it, you could, it just twirled. And I was kind of like, whoa. And, uh, and the Lord spoke to me and said, I have sent an angel of deliverance to abide in this building. And so I watched Brother Emery. Of course, he didn't know what was going on. But boy, something changed. And when he come back up that aisle and started across the front, everybody he had walked by, these are all gifts and visitors. They're just falling over in those chairs. I mean, those chairs are like folding chairs. They're just falling backwards, receiving the Holy Ghost and all. And he looked at me and said, man, what, what in the world is that? Now, I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to tell you right now, that angel abode in that building. We'd build an altar. We had, a, it was a portal. And Oat Mogi needed deliverance. I had people come visit. Matter of fact, the guy we had come do the carpet. We remodeled the building, put in new carpet, and his sister uh, was a lady we'd pray through, and he just got out of prison. And he's kind of a character. He's over there. And so the night before Easter, we're trying to wrap it all up because Easter's going to be the big, uh, you know, event. You know, we're back in the building. And so I went over there, and he's kind of working around a little bit. He said, Hey, I need to talk to you. I said, Okay, what's going on, Danny? He said, I'll tell you what's going on. He said, I want to know what lives in this building. I said, what you talking about? He said, I, I want to know what's in this building. I said, Danny, what you talking about? He said, I'm telling you several times that I've been down here working. He said, I just see a, a white just move across. He said, I'm telling you, my skin starts to crawl. He said, it's kind of weird stuff. He said, I want to know what lives in this building. Boy, some of you are looking at me like I've lost my ever-loving mind. I said, Danny, there is an angel of deliverance. I took it so literal, I changed the name of the church from the United Pentecostal Church of Oak Mulgee to Deliverance Tabernacle. I said, Danny, there's an angel of the Lord that lives here, and he's been sent here. He delivers. He said, oh, my Lord. I said, you come to church in the morning? I don't think I'll be there. But about halfway through the service, old Danny come walking through the back door. He's sitting back there in the back. And I just looked back there at him, waved at him. And the next thing I knew, brother, he lets out a war cry. He comes flying up that aisle, falls on the altar. And guess what happened? Danny got delivered. I'm telling you, you show me a church that'll build an altar, I'll show you where angels will ascend and descend. You show me people that build an altar to the wrong thing, I'll show you demonic activities that come and go. I'm going to close now. I am convinced that there are key strategic places in the state of California that it's time for us to take the battle to the gate. I mean that. I really do. Now, I'm going to make an appeal to you. And uh, Pastor, I won't, I won't, I'm submitted to you, and I, I, I think you know that. But 
for, for years now, for years now, we've all heard the, the vision and the prophecies about California being set on fire and seeing all these flames and it becoming, coming together, all these fires coming together, creating one flame. And it goes down, down the coast of California. It gets down on what you would call the I-10 corridor. And then that fire begins to spread from the west going toward the east. And uh, it's just moving. And the communities are being set on fire. The Holy Ghost is there. And uh, I can't tell you the, the prophecies that I've had people tell me about that and, and the vision that God gave me of the fire and all that stuff. And uh, it just moves across that I-10 corridor. So uh, I have given my life and my ministry to see that vision fulfilled. Because I believe it's time for it to happen. And I'm, I don't want us to miss it. But if we want the fire to fall, the fire's got to have an altar. I was preaching for Brother Bounds, I don't know, two or three years ago in Message of Tongues. One of the young men gave interpretation of Message of Tongues. And he said, you ask me where my fire is. My fire is in the heavens above this city. You ask me when will you see the fire. I tell you that my fire looks for an altar. If you build me an altar and put the sacrifice on it, I am a consuming fire and I will fall. And I believe if we'll start building God those altars and putting ourselves on that altar, I am believing God that a fire will fall all through Northern California, ah, well, all through Northern California, going down the coast, spreading all the way across to Florida. Now here's, here's where I'm coming to you. I, uh, I felt that. Matter of fact, I've changed a lot of our church structure and my ministry to focus on that. And uh, so I've contacted every superintendent on that I-10 corridor. Look, uh, and I want to say this carefully. It's not like I need your approval to do what God wants to do. I'm just letting you know what's going to happen. And... Uh, so I, I, I told him, I said, look, we want, these are the cities, and uh, I just want you to know, and, and we just kind of want your blessing, and you not to be blindsided by it. And all of them, Brother Haney, were excited. Oh, Brother Morgan, let's do this. Let's, 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 let's do this. So uh, we did a rally over in Pensacola with Brother Kenzie, and the presence of God was so powerful and strong. Uh, we just did one in El Paso where the UPC, the Apostolic Assemblies, and everybody come together. After the meeting, after the service, we was in a meeting with the pastors and preachers out there, and there's a, probably 25 or 30 of them in there just talking about this is what God's going to do. And, man, they got so excited about it. And, just, and other things happened. But here's, here is the focus, is that Brother Barnes and Brother Cole both seen the I-10 quarter and what God was going to do. But Brother Barnes, when he seen it, he seen a dragon and its head was in New Orleans. Its body went all the way through southern Louisiana and its tail rested in Houston. And said that is one of the seven seats of Satan in the world. And that's, that's where he dwells right there. See, the I-10 corridor is the old Spanish trail. So when the Spaniards come in, you can go to St. Augustine, Florida, and they got a big gate there and said, this is the gate to the uh, Spanish trail. And so the Spaniards is the first ones to trek across America. And then they got over here into California, and that's why Catholicism is so prevalent and so strong, and that's why it's a stronghold in these areas. Whew. And so Brother Barnes seen that, and so, you know, Crazy me. All right. Let's do this. And uh, we can't do it alone. So on uh, July the 24th, boy, I, I may get in trouble for saying some of this stuff. I've been to Houston three or four times. 
and uh, trying to, guys, matter of fact, I just preached one out of their camp, and I preached on war for the prophecy. Now, these prophecies were given, but you guys are going to have to quit fighting each other and go to fighting for what God wants to do. And so, uh, so here's the deal. On July the 24th, I'm preaching that Sunday for Brother Mike Sarton there in New Orleans. I know that New Orleans is the head and the big boy. I get that. And I've had enough hell in my life. You know, in one sense, the enemy wants to kind of like, you know, leave me alone. And I think that's why this message is so important to me especially. Take it to him. It's time to take it to him. You know, I'm going to say this, and maybe I may preach this in San Francisco this afternoon. You got to get madder than hell. Oh my God, Brother Morgan. Yeah, just think about it. Satan's cast down, he hits the earth, he's full of fury, he's mad. And he's going to wreck havoc, and the church has got to get madder than hell. It's got to get madder than the devil and say, mm, we're, here we come, we're going to take the battle to the gate. But on July the 24th, we're going to meet with all the area pastors, Presbyter's area pastors at Brother Sarton's to discuss. Now, we'd already been to Baton Rouge and kind of did a little deal there with AYC and uh, Flo Shaw and the World Network of Prayer. But I'm asking you, I am beseeching you that you would pray for that July the 24th meeting that we find the mind of God and the will of God and that God can amass an army. There's no way that we can, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know why we think that we can send into these major strongholds one lone home missionary or one pastor into major spiritual strongholds and expect them, well, let's see what you can do. When we decided to break the back of Hitler, we stormed Normandy. It wasn't just one soldier with a gun and some rations and stuff. I mean, brother, we pulled an army of allied forces together. And when we hit it, we hit it hard. And I'm convinced that's the way that we need to take our cities. We need to take the battle to the gates and we need to amass an apostolic army. I said an apostolic army. Get them all together. Get the generals and the captains and the colonels and the sergeants. Get them all together. Get an apostolic council together. Marabohu Kishahai. Woo. You know what? I had, I had a man of God call me just a few weeks ago, and he said, Brother Morgan, he said, this is what God wants to do in the area, in another country, and all this stuff. He said, but here's the key for you. You've got to find. He said, I think he said seven men that will agree with you and join with you for this to happen and for these things. I'm asking you to be one of them. I sincerely mean that. I'm asking you to be one of them. Woo. Mm. Woo. It's time to take the battle to the gates. We could take our communities and we could take our cities. If we build him an altar, get an open heaven, let angels come. Now, can I go just a little further? Now, Brother Haney, I, I, I don't want to cross any, seriously anything that you teach. But I know that a lot of people, even Brother Barnes, believed that Michael was the prince of Israel. I personally believe that Michael is the warring angel for God's people. I, that, that's what I believe. When I was in revival in uh, Lake Charles, uh, oh my God, the, 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 the presence of God and just so, so powerful services, just, it, it marked me. And uh, two or three of those services, different people seen it. And uh, this is another weird deal. And when they seen it, we all knew that Michael had appeared in that building. And so, um, we, uh, oh, such a visitation. One service, it just, the, all the men had flooded on the platform. 
and they just fallen under the power and the presence of God and just just and so I knew what it was like to be in a service where I felt like Michael was there and the strength that comes from him and so um, we're getting ready to do the Crusades in 2001 and we were helping oversee the Manila Crusade and I was supposed to speak that Saturday night and uh, so we get over there but the week before we left bombs started going off and the Muslims were setting even in Manila they were setting bombs off so a lot of people were calling are we going to cancel we're going to keep going on through this and all so brother Mallory what do you guys think I said well, brother Mallory you know we put a lot of time in this and all and I said I just thank God to protect us and so but just about a day or two before we went my family was going to go on this trip I have this crazy dream and in the dream uh, I'm walking, it's almost like an airport corridor. I'm walking down through it, and a woman appears, and she says, uh, and I had John Mark with me, just a little thing that I had him with me in the dream, and she said, we want him, we want your son. And I said, no, I'm not going to give you my son. Now, I mean, since then, there's a couple of times I would have gave him away, but not. <laughs> but I said, no, you're not taking my son, absolutely not. She said, we want your son. Now, spirits spirits manifest one or two ways they either manifest in the feminine or the masculine they either manifest as a subtle serpent or a roaring lion so when it, when you dream or god shows you something that deals with the woman in it it's dealing through subtility this is how the enemy is going to come at you to seduce or through subtility when he shows you a man coming at you, that means he's going to come straight at you. I mean, it's, it's going to be a full frontal attack. And so I, I reasoned with that lady. So finally she walked off, and then I walked in another little room. It, it, it was almost like a restroom, but it wasn't. I walked in this room, and there was a man in there. And I mean, he got really physical and violent. He said, we're going to take that boy of yours. And I mean, brother, you, now just listen to me. You ever been had a dream where you knew I'm getting upset? And brother, we're about to have a fight right here. Well, that's the feeling that I started getting. Mm. I said, we're not giving you, and I'm not giving you this boy. So the dream ended. I didn't dare tell Sister Morgan about the dream or that trip would have been canceled on the spot. So we get over there, and so Saturday, we're in the prayer room praying. And uh, man, I was just, you know, feeling some resistance and a little reluctance about things. And so... We're in there praying, and man, it was, it was one of them thundering prayer times. And, and there were several young people in there, which I do believe that the hyphen student AIDS group is the ground troops of this end time revival. I really do, the young ones. And so I, uh, I'm in there praying, and Brother Shatwell was there, and he come over and said, the Lord said, you better pick that sword up and do what he told you to do. Yes, sir, all right. You know, you don't tell Brother Shatwell no. I mean, he looks like Godzilla, so you don't tell him no, you know. And so, well, we get to prayer, and I'm telling you, man, it just it moved, that authority moved in there. And so I, 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 we've been in there a while, so I'm getting ready to leave. i got to go change, get ready for the service. And when I walk toward the door to leave the room that we have for prayer, Brother Brought, missionary at the time, the Philippines was sitting there. And so when I walked by him, he reached out and grabbed me, and he said, uh, he said, hey, Brother Morgan, I, I need to tell you something. Well, I noticed in prayer, he's over there kind of, and that's not like Brother Brawl. He's just pretty sedate, you know, pretty calm. But I mean, he was really, he said, Brother Morgan, I'm not given to visions, but God gave me a vision a while ago. And he said, I've got to tell you. I said, okay, what is it? He said, I seen the grandstand over at Lynetta Park, downtown Manila, which would seat probably 15,000 just in the grandstand. He said, I seen that grandstand, but it was filled with angels. He said, I mean, it was filled with angels. But he said, but standing in the midst of those angels was a very predominant angel. And in the vision, the Lord said, ask Brother Morgan who he is. Because when you ask him who he is, he will know that I have sent to help. I didn't even hesitate. I said, it's Michael. And then the dream, the dream went just like this. Whew. You're now dealing with with the nation of Islam and the Muslims wanting to take the next generation of the Philippine Islands. They're after them. Mm. 
we can't get them through subtility and seduction. We'll get violent and we'll take, we'll take the next generation and we'll hold them in captivity of this doctrine. And so I just got up that night preaching and I just reared back and said, I bind every spirit of Islam and I bind this in the name of Jesus. And I'm here to decree with apostolic authority that you will not take the next generation of the Filipinos. I bind you and I curse you in Jesus' name. It's not going to happen. Now, after service, Brother Mallory come to me. He said, my God, you lose your mind. I said, about what? He said, we're in an open air meeting. All these bombs going off. And then you get up and go after that like that. I said, that's exactly what that spirit wants. It wants to intimidate us. It is a spirit of fear. And it wants to intimidate us where we back away from it. But I'm telling you, when it's the right time and it's time to take the battle to the gates, trust me. God's got enough as the Lord of hosts to send everything that we need to take it. I feel faith in this place right now. I'm telling you in the fear of God today, I sense while I'm preaching in this building, I sense a strong angel of the Lord that has been sent here. I said, I sense a strong angel of the Lord that's been sent here. He is here to help you take the battle to the gate. I wish everybody would believe what I'm preaching right now. I wish everybody would believe it's time, 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 it's time to take it to him. Somebody ought to lift your voice right now. Somebody ought to really pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Aren't you tired of the enemy bringing the battle to you? Take it to him. Woo! Come on, I feel a witness of the Holy Ghost in this place right now. If you're not coming to the front, reach over and join someone close to you. One can put a thousand, two, ten thousand, three, a hundred thousand. There's commanded blessings in unity. Join with somebody. If you're a part of this church, join with somebody close to you right now. We're getting ready to pray as a body. We're getting ready to pray a collective prayer. We're building an altar here today. We've built it through the years, but we're going to build an altar here today. And we're going to believe that angels are going to ascend and descend. And we're going to believe that God's going to send everything we need for us to take the battle to the portals of Stockton and to the portals of the world. Pray in the Holy Ghost here a little bit. Lift your voice fervently and pray with the authority of the Holy Ghost. Sound off to the enemy. Let him know I've been fearful long enough. You've taken too much of my stuff. <laughs> 